major focus of our research is the mechanical electrical properties of both skeletal and cardiac muscle. And we're kind of unique in that we go from anything from the cellular level all the way to uh, organ level to large animal research. I've been studying black bears in early and late hibernation out in the field for the last 14 years. For four to six months of total immobilization in a den, they really don't lose any muscle strength or muscle mass. If you have a patient who's in an ICU bed for that long, they're going to lose a lot of muscle strength that have to go through uh, rehabilitation to be able just to walk. But the bears, on the other hand, they can wake up at a moment's notice and defend themselves. So we actually developed our technologies to go out into the field. One of the things we do is stimulated force assessment. We're looking at the loss of muscle over time in patients, stimulate the nerves to get the muscles to contract. It's all non-invasive. Then with our collaboration with Dr. Tim Lasky at Medtronic, who actually got an undergrad in mechanical engineering and wildlife biology, He's able to bring in a lot of the technologies that are used to monitor cardiac patients. We're able to implant those and to look at the cardiac function of bears. And there's phenomenal things that occur. Heart rate will drop to, in some cases, five beats a minute during hibernation. But at the same time, when a bear takes a breath, it will jump up to about 45 beats a minute so it has this very pronounced sinus arrhythmia. The respiratory rates will drop to one to three breaths a minute, and their body temperatures only go from a normal temperature of about 37 to 38 degrees centigrade down to 34, 35. So they're only mildly hypothermic during this whole period of time. So we're looking at um, the hormone cascades that are released during hibernation that are attributed to inducing the hibernation state seeing if they have medical applications. One of the things that we're doing that's really novel is we're actually reanimating um, human hearts. And these are hearts that have been deemed non-viable for transplantation, that were gifts from the organ donors and their families to the lab. And just like a heart transplant, you have four to six hours before you need to reanimate that heart. The visible heart is a unique apparatus and system where we basically cannulate all the great vessels and then we delivered a clear buffer that tries to best simulate blood and then we'll reanimate them which means we'll get it to beat on its own as they would inside their bodies. Then we'll put high resolution video scopes or fiber scopes inside the various chambers or vessels of the heart and with this clear buffer then we can look at the nuances and variations in anatomy. And this functional anatomy really gives someone a unique 3D perspective on a beat-by-beat -beat basis. This is critical for design engineers. So if you're going to design devices, no two human hearts are the same. The heart changes its shapes with different disease states. This is our um, heart library. We have over 200 human hearts that have um, been donated by organ donors whose hearts weren't fit for transplant. This is an example of a hypertrophic left ventricular wall. So this is much thicker than it would be in a healthy heart. And this is due to the patient's history of hypertension. Uh, the heart muscle had to work harder to pump against the high blood pressure. And as a result, like any muscle, it compensates by increasing in size but the chamber size is a lot smaller. So with every pump, you're pumping less volume, and so it makes it a less efficient pump. So there's remodeling the heart related to disease, and then upon treatment, you can get reverse remodeling. All those things have to be kept in mind when designing specific devices. These two hearts are examples of some of the hearts that we have that came with devices in them. So this is an example of a biventricular pacing device, so it paces the right ventricle with a pacing lead in the right ventricular apex. And you can also see as it goes through the tricuspid valve, it has fibrosed into the valve, which is part of the body's natural response to a foreign object. And they stimulate the left side, which is 
what most of my research is on by putting a lead into the cardiac venous system. So you can see the lead enters into the coronary sinus and you can see again it's fibrous into the tissue. And it wraps around in this vein where it will then pace the left side from the outside. We've cannulated these hearts, dilated them so they hold the end diastolic shape as if they were full of blood and then they are permanent specimens like that. And we've been able to use different imaging to look at the structures. This is intercardiac echo. It is uh, ultrasound units where you use a catheter to feed inside of the heart to look at various structures within it. There's a lot of technology that goes not only into the developing the whole system to allow us to reanimate these hearts, but also um, looking at the prototype designs of various leads that go inside the heart. Our lab has actually had the opportunity to reanimate 46 human hearts. On a weekly basis, we're reanimating swine hearts, very similar between swine and humans. Well, I've been reanimating uh, hearts for the last 14 years, and it doesn't matter if it's a swine heart or a human heart, it's still exciting. We actually have a whole free access website that anybody can go online and see the functional anatomy from these human hearts.